fascinating to see how the various manifestations of, of, of that board and the different requirements, the, the different ways have sort of uh, construct itself. Um, so, for you know, for example, back in 12 years ago, it was all it, it was representation meant you need to have people from large organisations, small organisations, medium-sized organisations. So the idea of representation has just moved on enormously since then. I'm sure we'll come on to that uh, uh, in the discussion, but I think um, you know, I think we, we're delighted to work with Buzzacott on this guide because we saw how challenging the role of a trustee um, is, particularly in international government organisations. I think it is more widely in the charity sector, but I think it's particularly acute for international organisations. And um, I'm sure we'll explore some of those challenges, but it's 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 quite severe. And I think you know, lots of people say the job is impossible. And uh, I think what we're trying to do with this guide is 
go from the impossible to the possible and see how, how the role can be fulfilled. Right. Um, I'm Eddie Fench, I'm one of the partners here at Buster Cotton in, in the charity and not for profit team, uh, but I'm also uh, on the Finance and Resources Committee of uh, an international development organisation, so I've got a bit of both perspectives. I've been working with charities and not for profits since the 90s, so I've seen those kind of changes you're talking mm -hmm. about writ, writ large over that period. And I've worked with a lot of international charities back in my days at EDO when I was training coming through. And, and and the the sort of things that trustees are required to consider, and the, the amount of time you're expected to spend actually understanding it has just grown exponentially over that time. And I think you need to know that really one, of, one of our key things that we wanted to do was that there has been an increasing amount of expectation that you're across policies and processes that you understand what's going on in different countries. And it's all the things that have been pinned on trustees um, through some of the things that have happened in the sector in the last few years. But we don't really see it as an onerous and, and uh, difficult role if, if it's approached in, in the right way. I mean, we really just wanted to put out there some information, um, and especially maybe for newer trustees or trustees in small because I know a lot of people probably got day jobs in the sector from looking through who's attending, and, and maybe those of us with day jobs who work in the sector often have already got a bit of a head start on that. Maybe people who come to the sector as, as trustees who haven't been involved before um, were who had most of them not been the ground together. Um, but it'd be interesting to hear from, from the room as to today how useful you found it to be having a visit and, and uh, how you might uh, get, get other trustees engaging with it. Thank you, thank you. And actually, you've ticked off the answer question that I was going to ask. Why did you create the guidance? You know, what are some of those challenges that you're looking to address? So, um, I guess you sort of both alluded to it, um, Mike and Eddie, in terms of the kind of changing in kind of role and expectation as trustees over recent years. I don't know. Is that something that you've experienced as well from your day job perspective um, in your time in the sector? Do you have anything about the No, absolutely. I think it's definitely changing. This, um, and I think this is one of the things that the report also did mention, which I think was really good. And by the way, I should say that I thought the report was a really, really good read. Um, I was saying earlier on that uh, anything to do with governance uh, is often seen as boring. Um, but this report is definitely not boring <laughs> to read, and it's a really good read and really does break down uh, the practicalities of what it is that you need uh, to have in a good governance. Um, in terms of the changing sort of role, um, I guess with, you know, I mean, with recent years, really, you know, we've had a pandemic, um, we've had issues around, you know, we had, of course, the measure of George Floyd, which, you know, does need to, to, you know, it needs to to be mentioned in the sense that it sort of it sort of highlighted really um, a lot of things that we need to look at in relation to culture, um, and it means that you know the trustees and board organisations within the FBA, within the NGO you know, uh, the United States and beyond have to look at this area as well. And I think that in itself having to grapple with that bond, you know, looking at. Uh, discussions around um, decolonization, decentralization, how do local communities, you know, actually do what they need to do for themselves. And, you know, all of these questions are particularly important. And I think um, trustees also have to have to grapple with that as well. And then, of course, you've got all the challenges with the aid sector and sector decline um, on budget, etc. So how do you do more with less? Um, um, and at the same time, as I was saying, uh, a lot of trustees also have their own sort of like 95 jobs as well. So how do you manage all of that? How do you also support the um, executives if you'd like to be able to move some of these things forward? So it's definitely changing. Um, it's, it's not going to get any easier. <laughs> um, and we were talking earlier um, about the coffee, weren't we, uh, around maybe some of the um, the differences uh, in in the role depending on the setting. So, a sort of a, a trustee of a purely UK-based charity versus a more international um, organisation, or, or indeed, um, you talk about your know, experience with, with trustees um, in other locations, even here, maybe across Europe rather than the so-called global self. So, yeah, I don't know if myself or others also have any any comments on that uh, on that. I suppose I could share that just very quickly and then I leave for my minute. <laughs> okay. But basically what I was saying was that what we have seen, uh, in particular in Francophone countries in Europe, um, is that the role of trustees is 
there's a sort of overlap between the role of trustees and the executive, which can be mm-hmm. really challenging, right? But so you have the person, you've got the president who's the chair, and they are seen to be going to all these events and speaking at sets and all of that. It can be really, it can be a challenge, and we've had a challenge with that. So it's near coming at it from a place where the role of trustees and the executive is very separate, right? And you're there to support the, the executive and the organization to move forward. So you can have that sort of challenge. But also, the other thing I want to mention is, as another example as well is that even when it comes to um, the implementation of policies with um, part of this, we've had a challenge before where in developing uh, in doing some work with partners in uh, in West Africa, we have a diversity policy where you know we have references to same um, same sex and and showing that every, that you know that it's inclusive. And in some of those um, countries, it is a crime. So you cannot expect your partner to take that on. So what do you do, right? And so these are you know these are some of the things that we also have to have to bear in mind as well when we are working across. Course, you know, sort of the I guess that's where it becomes different when you're looking at the role of trustees for um, NGOs compared to the role of trustees within one geographical organization. Yeah, but if you have any other questions, comment on that, maybe from a city. Well, you can, not the I guess. So, uh, and I think that's one of the things that we, we found very interesting trying to weave into um, the guy group was that. Most of the ideas that we work with are registered as UK charities and this very specific legal framework around that. And, and a lot of that extra stuff that's been coming in um, you know, from, from CPR and other, other places. So, so the regulatory expectations on the UK trustees are quite specific, but then as you, as you go through internationalisation, decolonisation, those kind of processes, and you establish legal structures <coughs> elsewhere in the world, the, the, the frameworks they operate under, as well as the, the cultural stuff that's built up, but then the legal framework that they do. And, and engaging people in a way that focuses on the good organisation principles. So, so doing things well, regardless of legal structures and, and, and rules and regulations. And frankly, the country is a nightmare for, for being very procedural. Um, so we, we experience that a lot when we have to do all this. But, um, but, but that kind of trying to impose a, a sensible structure when, when actually you know you're working from a bias of, of, of a British way of thinking about it. Uh, we do find quite a challenge, and, and especially with uh, we were lucky enough to work with ActionAid through their process of evolving around the world, and that was really, really challenging. There's that sort of tension between uh, putting proper power in the hands of the people who are closest to, to where they were working, and also the trustees feeling a tiny bit paranoid still about being accountable to the charity commission and, and, all, and the donors. Um, it's, it's a really interesting one to work your way through. We, we find that's a big feature of a lot of our work. We do. Mike, I wonder if I could first mm. bring you in, I guess, if you're experienced with this bond and having worked with the board. And I'm just to you just in terms of what you enjoyed about the uh, trustee role, but how, how do you ensure that the trustee role is, is visible and, um, you know, to, to have any great governance to lie to mm. the Yeah, it's a really, it's a really good question. I think you, you can see, um, I think in the charity sector generally, but particularly in in INGOs where um, you know, issues of decolonisation, localisation are very live. I think they're often really live amongst the staff. And what you don't want is what you, what you don't want is the executive or the board to be sort of two steps behind the staff. So I think it's I mean I think it's critical that um, that the executive present the right information to the board and sensitize them to the kinds of issues that are li- alive to an organization i think you know um so it's, it, so the board has got to be really on top of what's uh, what's going on culturally in their organizations if they're going to seem relevant you know there's all sorts of there's all sorts of um other issues about duty of care and finances and so on but i think if if a board fails to, to grasp the sort of cultural nettle it will be exposed completely so i think um Understand, you know, and I think that that may be you, know, you don't want you don't want the board to go directly to the staff or the staff to go to the, to the board in quite that way. But how does the board get an understanding of the sort of culture in an organisation uh, and the way an organisation works? And how does how does it use the executive to find out what what's um, what's live in an organisation? I think you know, there, I think where 
where a board becomes or an executive becomes dislocated from the rest of the staff that's a, that's really problematic and so i think there's something um a board can make itself live when it shows itself to be on top of the on top of the critical issues but i think i mean my sense is that the most you know there's loads there's obviously loads of issues the boards need to be on top of but i think if they don't get the cultural dimension in this current in this current period that it's, it's fatal yeah, so I think we were talking about that, weren't we, in terms of, you know, the exception is that, you know, the culture should sort of come from the top and, and mm. in a way, and that should be go through the organisation, but, but, you know, how, how does the board keep up with that, with sort of all the change in expectations around culture yes. and leadership, you know, mm -hmm. that intention, not the intention necessarily, but working with the, with the other people. And, uh, and I think, you know, if, if, you know, we talk, we talk in the guide about how the, um, the board needs to set the, uh, so the example set the tone for the culture, but if it's, you know, again, it's got to, uh, the board, it's very difficult. The board has to be really alive to what's going on in the rest of the organisation, because if it, if it sets a tone which, which, the, which the staff have moved on from <laughs> months ago or years ago, then it's, then it's going to seem sort of out, out of date and, and, and not, you know, I think so. I think it's, it's I'm, not, I'm not sure I know the answer to it, but I mean, because it requires, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of information, a lot of sort of um, emotional intelligence to engage with that. So, you know, um, but I think it's really critical that, that the cultural dimensions of an organisation are are up to, you know, the board is up to date with what those are. That That's the way, to, and that's the way it will seem vital to the rest of the organisation. Thank you. Um, and I guess just picking up on one of the uh, points you were talking about earlier, um, Stella, in terms of some of the, the sort of challenges that the pandemic, that funding cuts and, you know, doing uh, more with less and you know, inflation. And, um, I guess, yeah, what, what, how does the board sort of balance its role here with the executive, I suppose, in terms of remaining agile and, and, and stepping in and, you know, making decisions where needed, but, you know, with such an unpredictable environment and, and I guess, not stepping on the exact toes, I don't know if you want to. Um, I guess, I mean, one of the things that I would say from my experience um, with, with Bond and with other, you know, with my own um, organisation as well, I think being able to stay on top of the, um, all of everything that is going on is vital, but of course, when you're only meeting four times a year, um, <laughs> that can be a challenge. But the role of committees that are linked into the board also vital and where you have the board and the members who are part of the committees as well that means that you've got a little bit more engagement going on throughout the year so you're not just meeting four times a year at the board you've also got the members and the trustees who are part of different committees as well which is what you have at home you have with our own organization as well so it allows the board to be a little bit more on top of different areas on in as much as possible on an ongoing basis and I think, as Mike was saying as well, that, that um, the role of the executive is really critical as well in this instance. With my own organisation, I would say that the executive do a little bit more instead of bringing the board in um, compared to the way that board actually operates. It's a little bit different, but that role of the executive is key in terms of its own relationship with the rest of the organisation and then its relationship with the board as well. And sort of trying to bridge the two uh, is particularly here. Yeah, I think that is critical. I agree. I, I see that as one of the biggest two. And, and you having both sides of that one, it's it really hard to see it. But, but certainly for me, being part of government, um, I hear lots of names in meetings and an office three or four years. I feel like I've never met some of them. I've stopped in the middle of it. But, but I do feel we're removed from the staff. And, and in some ways, exactly as you say, it's, 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 on the, it's on the management to bring the live issues to us. And, and that's where I see the, the role of government to where we try and be helpful and constructive is, is in the, the sort of gentle challenge to, to, to see whether we're being told everything that we should be being told because we're always getting it through a filter of, of what management think we should be interested in. And then so actually take a bit of time to exercise your own imagination and think about the things that they might not think they're interested in. But, you would still like to know about it. It's, it's a difficult, yeah, difficult part of the process. I think when we were sort of talking earlier in the week, you were reflecting on how mm. your role on, on a committee, and one of those of support committees, as Stella was saying, had been possibly a bit more involved, you know, <laughs> a couple of years ago when, you know, everything was. Well, 
I think, for, for a lot of us. Um, I, I, one of the biggest changes that's happened over the time I've been working in the sector is, is that the it used to provide core funding to a lot of organisations in the sector and moved away from that. And, and like many others, the organisation I work with it has had a challenging time adjusting its, its, its work. I mean, I won't bring the competition about business models, but, but adapting um, to that big change. And when the sort of sudden cut a couple of years ago was announced, um, that, that really meant that our, our budget was in, in quite a serious precarious state. So we had to start meeting more often. And that's where that process I was just talking about, that the sort of just generally probing how have, have you thought about all the things that should could be structured. I mean, I think it's a very good plan for how they sort of know what the trigger points were and then they want to start making difficult decisions and that kind of thing. But, but the governance element was really uh, having more frequent conversations and just providing that sort of slightly outside viewpoint to make sure that everything uh, which was getting put into the process. Um, but then, of course, yeah, we've had the pandemic. <laughs> Who knows what else? Um, at the same time and since. So um, I think the, the, the normal situation now is that we're dealing with a crisis, isn't it? So, so. Thank you. Um, I wanted to come back to um, something that we just mentioned at the beginning in terms of boards being representative, and I think you mentioned that, how that's, what that actually means, how that sort of changed as well right, and over time. But I think we, we, with our NGO, we've got to see that we're looking to, to sort of be representative as an organisation, so be that the sort of make of your staff uh, and, as well as the board. And I guess how you know, how, how, how do you manage that, uh, particularly looking about the being representatives of the communities that you serve, but how do you sort of manage that challenge and, and those tensions, maybe with UK charity law, maybe with what we were saying uh, before about the skills that you might need on, on a board um, in terms of delivering effective governments? Thoughts from probably all of you on this. So our representation, I mean, I think in terms of the skills that you need, right? So yes, there is, you know, you're looking at diversity across the board. You know, it's about the skills, it's about the community that you represent, and the whole sort of range of things, really. Um, I think organization of the board itself have to be, I mean, it needs to start from the top as well, right? Um, and the board has to be much more proactive about that. And to be honest, in this in this day and age now, with everything being sort of virtual and hybrid, we really cannot say that we cannot find people who, who represent our community. Because <laughs> they don't necessarily have to be in that location, right, if you're looking for the right skills, because that's also the other sort of excuse it's about, oh, they aren't enough people, we can't find the right skills, but you know, the people can actually engage, uh, you know, like virtually as well. So I think that just really takes being a lot more proactive uh, and sort of having a look at what it is that you're looking at fall within the organisation where the gaps are. Um, and I think often also depending on the kind of organisation that you have and how diverse it is as well, the staff can also tell, right, you know, if you want to do a survey and to get, you know, some ideas or to get a sense of what it looks like at the top, you can also get that from, from the, from the organisation itself. And I think um, it, it always seems to me that that's, that's about, that's, that's very practical in a sense and, and it's really just about reaching out and being able and, and my perhaps because I think we picked up on it in, in the guide don't we a bit of um, a bite from from bond out there as well so it doesn't maybe come up those kind of practical yes. steps. Um, yeah and I, I just I mean it's quite interesting because bond uh, bonds and uh, we about to have our AGM in uh 24 November and there's, there's two places on the board that are up for election having a chat internally and um, sort of saying, oh, we need somebody, we need somebody on the board who's an expert in cyber security. And I think, do we really want somebody on the board who's an expert in cyber security? I, sus I suspect, I suspect, I suspect that might be a wasted use of a place, a place on the board. And I, I, I suppose the point I'm making is that the, um, you know, it used to be, or oh, we need somebody, um, well, the American model is to have somebody who's rich on the board who can pay for things. <laughs> or we, the British model is we need to find somebody who can fundraise for us. But I think there are other there are there are other ways to solve those um, problems. So you can focus more on appropriate representation um, on the board in terms of the communities you, you work with. But, but there, are, there are you know you've got examples. Um, so you could have a you know you could have a, a, a loose arrangement where you get fundraising advice from a, a group of experts that are not 
that are tied into the board, but not necessarily part of the board. And then you've got organisations like um, uh, Restless Development. I think they have they have um, sort of multiple loose boards in in in, in country, and they that they that sort of coalition, almost a coalition of boards. So there's there's ways of um, there's ways of achieving representation. You know, for each organisation, it's it's what's appropriate to, to to them. But you know, there are different different models exist all over the place. Um, and obviously, I mean, Bond represents over 400 organisations. So you know. What, what happens in a large organisation where there are, you know, there are, there are resources where, where the board is actually sort of um, administered in, in, a, in a way. It's very different from a smaller organisation. Um, and so, you know, you have, to, you have to work out what's appropriate for you, but there are kind of, there are shortcuts to representation that allow, allow the board to be, perhaps be more representative in a way that it, it, uh, it's, uh, it's actually on the board is appropriate for itself. Mm -hmm. Given all of those sort of models, then bringing it back to the sort of I guess, UK law and, and yeah. sort of those sort of directors. Yeah, I think problem. that's often where, where a perceived problem is, isn't it? That the UK board is a board of directors under company law often and, uh, and, and responsible under the Charities Act. And certainly in those international federation type structures, that, that I've seen tensions where mm. uh, the country programmes maybe are, are separate legal entities and, and don't necessarily respond well to the UK board telling them what to do, but also the, the, the countries across you know, the, the fundraising countries um, are independent of each other as well. And uh, but, well, yes, so that there are situations where certain countries, um, if they're the parent entity, um, aren't very mindful of the UK legal structure, and you have to work on making sure that the that the that the UK legal structure, the charity tax stuff, the company tax stuff gets respected enough because it is properly legal requirements and, and you have to be accountable. But, but really, be realistic that the human relationships are actually that you're part of a much bigger organisation and, and that requires a bit of um, flexibility in your thinking, but it also requires a secretarial plan somewhere in the piece to make sure that when you do the dot eyes and cross teeth thoroughly, that gets done. Uh, but the, the, fall, the, the falling out that sometimes happens, I, I think, I mean, as you said, it's, it's, it's communication, it's, it's cross representation, it's having people from each one sitting on each other's audit committees and going to each other's boards and meeting regularly so that you feel like you're one organisation and not lots of separate organisations that are slightly fighting each other some of the time. But, but that's, where, that's where I think the legal stuff gets in the way and, and you need to try, try and think about the legal stuff. Into, you know, I say that too. <laughs> I guess just um, it was sort of mentioned earlier, but yeah, everything that we're we're kind of hearing in terms of you know a trustee's role and you know everything that is within that and, and the challenges and the you know uh, additional sort of regulations and expectations, maybe expectation gaps in in some instances in terms of what what you are doing and what people think you're doing. Um, is there is there an argument really for trustees being remunerated? And obviously, we were talking about mm. some different models earlier as well. I think that we need to go to the UX, for example, but there are models where, where you can be, and, and the charity structures are very different, and, and management and, and trustees can get a bit more mixed up. And as Mike says, a lot of the time, the, the trustees are the people who put on the bow tie and go to the dinners and mm. chuck money in the pot. Um, but uh, yeah, I think. I think there's a, a real discussion to be had around the fact that you have an executive management who do all the things that a company's directors might do in terms of having all the authority to act for the organisation, but, but don't have the technical legal responsibility. And then you have this bunch of objects who turn up four times a year and are expected to be legally responsible for everything. And that maybe does need another look. And the, the, uh, things like a lot of uh, bits of the charity sector are fun ways to have. The person who is effectively the chief executive on the board. So, so the education sector is very common principles to be part of the governing body. Um, and we should, I think, have that discussion in the charity sector again. But certainly, a, a, a few modestly paid um, trustees wouldn't be a bad thing, which I think is great for representation as well, because there's a lot of people who can't afford to just drop work and be a trustee. And uh, if, if they were compensated uh, for the role, might find it easier to participate. Yeah, um, I, yeah, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I think, yes, from the legal point of view in particular, there is 
there is a, a conversation around that, right? Because we do want people, I mean, trustees do take their role seriously, but you know, considering that it does come with legal responsibility as well, there is probably more discussion to be had around that. But I think there are also um, some possible challenges with that earlier when I was talking about in some countries like in Europe where you have the trustees taking on more of a responsibility and they are really right? So perhaps there is a sense in which they feel that that responsibility does go a little bit beyond just sort of being in the back seat and driving, uh, but actually being in the front seat. And um, so um, I think those conversations would have to take all of that into account. But there are also other ways as well to um, for your trustees to also feel that in as much as they are there to support, they are also able um, to to benefit from the experience. So you know, so we give uh, you know our in my uh, organization, um, depending on the skills on the board, we offer them opportunity to represent the organization every now and again depending on what's happening and it could be uh it could be uh, a speaking engagement abroad somewhere at the UN etc that sort of thing so we always look at our trustees and even the committees as well in that sense because we want to involve them a bit more so we provide those opportunities for them as well so I think there are also different ways that it's about trustees feeling that they're also getting something out of it and therefore being more engaged and there are also other ways so can I just make a quick bit before we move on from this topic? I, I, I do think the basic principle of charity trustees giving their time is, uh, and, and trustees not being rewarded for the trustee, but the figure is, is still a very good principle. Just looking at time, and I'm probably going to open it up to questions from the room. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. I guess is what would you say to someone that's considering taking on? Uh, the role of trustee, and I think there were a couple of people in the room where you said it was your first uh, role. Taking a trustee of, of an international NGO, um, I guess what's the most useful part to take on? Other than reading Yes, uh, well, I, I think you need to go into it with your eyes open. <laughs> um, uh, you know, recognise the challenge and responsibilities and the time it takes. I think on the, on the other side, I mean, I think the, it seems to me that, I mean, it's already happening, I suspect, but it, I'm not sure all the trustees of um, INGOs are probably wrestling with it or getting to grips with the issue, but most INGOs will have to change over the next few years. So what, so there's a fantastic, if you're really that way inclined and you want to sort of um, move the dial along, shift, 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 you know, get involved in organisational change, and it's a great, and that's, you know, that's your, you know, you're not going to sit there and have four quarterly meetings, but there's, you may be talking about uh, re-strategizing, refinancing, restructuring, um, working with the executive around that. I think that's going to be the, uh, what's going to happen to many, many organizations in the bond network over the next few years, because I think it's, uh, you know, we're on a sort of process of change, which is, is, is unstoppable, I think. So I think, if you, you know, there's something really, Good to grasp by being part of a trustee of an INGO at this moment. It's not, it's not without risk, it's not without kind of challenge, but it's, it's uh, you know, it's, in some senses, it's probably the most exciting job in trusteeship that you could possibly have, but you know, not without risk. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I suppose, you know, just to, to add to that, I mean, the next few uh, sort of like years are. Uh, going to be rather interesting and lots of changes within the uh, within the sector um, as well. So yes, that's just to go into it with your eyes wide open. But it also does mean that uh, there will be quite a lot to bring to it. There's a lot that people can actually bring to it and, and you know to to the changes that are also taking place as well. So you know so it's about thinking about what it is that you feel that you can bring to it. Um, and also how you think perhaps for yourself we can also support you in terms of your growth as well. It does go two ways, right? And I think that that's the other truth. It goes both ways. It's also the way in which that you also stay engaged as well. So I think you've got to look at it in that, in that sense. But absolutely, I think it's, um, I would see it as uh, exciting times. Um, so if you've got a vision and you want to be engaged, absolutely. But also be be aware of the, the legal responsibility. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
I couldn't really say much more than that. I think it's really important, though, to, to have a discussion with the chair or other trustees and just be clear about how much time and um, whatever you, you can commit. And if you're comfortable that, that it's a good match, uh, then go for it. Make sure you are a good match for a particular organisation uh, you want to work or be thinking of work. Thank you. Um, I don't know if we have any questions from the panel. People in the room, anybody who would like to put it back in the room? Thank you so much uh, for today. I'm making a lot of good nuggets of information to take away. One big challenge that we're facing, we're, um, we're registered in the US, um, we have no paid staff, and we operate in the And we do have um, somebody in the US who currently is being paid on a per project basis and the board trustees basically fund that work um, and then we go out to partners to fund particular big projects that we want to run. So the question that we're facing is, is there a, a if we want to then scale that so that we potentially have more people like this individual in other countries who are doing like project leadership, is there another jurisdiction that is potentially more favorable than the US? Sorry, I know it's, this is UK. <laughs> I'd have to walk you down to a third floor to talk to my US, US tax specialist. So yeah. I, I, I think um, it, it, uh, well, it depends and it gets very complicated with yeah. the, the jurisdictions that you're putting people right. into as well, whether they have to be regarded as employees locally, whether you have to, if you're operational, have a legal structure in a particular right. country or from just your branch of the US or UK entity. Right. I'm afraid it's a patchwork. Um, I don't think US um, employment law as well as um, maybe that's but um, I would imagine that US employment law is probably easier to work around in some states than UK law, but it's been right. a state in as well, wasn't it? Right. That was one part of the yeah. yeah. In UK, it's, it's a good case. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I tell all your that. No, I, I, I think you'd have to get pretty specialist advice depending right. on which yeah. countries you were thinking of operating in. And, and the interaction between the law of the country you wanted your head office to be in and those countries as well. It's one of the reasons it's quite complex. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe, sorry if I could just come back to that, I mean, we've, we've actually been, um, uh, been looking at employment in Belgium and Nigeria and we have found that there are actually some companies who Work across different work across different you know um, countries um, and sort of like jurisdictions, and they will take on the employment and all the purposes for you as well. And then there are also others in country who will support with that process, so they won't necessarily take it on. But they'll do the payroll, they'll do all of those things for you as well. Um, I can I can give you a name or two. <laughs> We'd like to ask the panel's advice on time management. You sign up to be on the board. It's very clear that there's sort of X number of days, it's sort of four meetings. Maybe you're on a committee, it's another four meetings. Night beautifully spaced out, but it's those once in a blue moon existential crises that, that pull you in. And they are so important that they, they do override sort of my day job. But it's very hard sometimes to, to say no because of how important that sort of the crisis with, with the board is. But it means everything else has to always be put aside. And I find it very difficult to say to say no, but I am then sacrificing the mm -hmm. job. I'm, I'm lucky enough, I haven't because I'm not actually on the board, I was going on to a company for getting the old way. Um I I I think <laughs> I mean it's 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 your work. Your own, are you self employed? Right? I have self employed. So, so it's a real choice. A lot of people just have the choice to do that. But I think that, that then again comes down to that clarity, doesn't it, of how much time you can give 
and 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 being clear with the organisation and the chair, if, if you simply can't pop over from time to time, really put the phone in the evenings and, and go through the highlights of the day. Um, that can be the best, the best I can offer. <laughs> so I can see the problem. It's uh, it's a bad answer, isn't it? Absolutely, because I'm, I'm on the board of a slightly smaller NGO yeah. and a newer NGO, and the kids, mm. they often just need boots on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess that's the, I think this is where we were saying earlier on about um, the role of the um, executive, and I think this is where, depending on their capacity as well, and how much they are expecting you to do, and perhaps it's about finding a strategy to support them to take on more of whatever needs to to be done so that you're still able to be there to support. But there are times as well where, as you said, it's it's a crisis and it does actually need, I mean, this is where the board's role then also becomes mm -hmm. critical. And yes, um, you may then have to see how you manage and what things you drop, etc. Um, you know, sometimes when it comes to the reputation of the organization itself, you, you know, uh, and crisis, <clears throat> then it's yeah, then the board becomes really the face, if you like, of the organization at that point. And I guess these are all the things that we need to be mindful of when we go into the role as well. But I think sometimes where it's a crisis within the organization, it's also about the, the capacity of the executive themselves. So it, it really is about looking to see what strategies, what support can we actually provide the executive themselves to be able. To take on a lot of water to work, so then we are basically coming in with the advice and the support. <coughs> yeah, I think that comes back to something Mike said a while back about the difference between larger and smaller charities. And, and certainly for me, if I'm honest, but I, I did try being a trustee for a smaller charity and I found that I didn't give enough time to satisfy my own confidence. So, so I, I, now I'll, I will only get engaged with the charity where I think that the executive can deal with pretty much anything and are only going to want me for advice and input. Um, so it's, it's right open to the fact that if you, if you work with a small charity where the executive can't deal with it and the crisis without your support, it, it's a risk in the run, isn't it? I think, I think there's also something, um, I think lots of organisations are beset with multiple crises at the same time, like these days. I think, you, know, you, know, you just think about back in January, people were anticipating. 2% inflation, da, 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 da. <laughs> um, meanwhile, um, anyway, the, the, so I think there's something around uh, you know, well, as the risk profile in an organisation changes, just making sure that the um, executive communicates effectively to the board how it's all changing and where it, where it's going to need support and not sort of, uh, you, know, you can't, you, the quarterly meeting's not going to work. It's, it needs more, more regular communication, I think. Um, I'd be surprised if since January most boards have been meeting quarterly. I mean, we have, but there are conversations, there are lots of conversations in between. Um, so I think it's just um, uh, ensuring that the sort of executive pinpoint risks that need attending to. I mean, I think sort of big um, reputational risks are things you, you've just got to dive into. But I think if it's if it's financial risk, or, or um, uh, then there are things that you can, that the executive can highlight those to, to the board as soon as they are happening and they, that they need attendance to. I think that's, that's a, way, a way around it. But I think, um, I don't know, the executive, I think, needs to be allowed to be released from some other roles that it might have in terms of maybe sort of part of the strategy needs to be put aside whilst. Something else, this, this particular issue is dealt with. Yeah, it's quite difficult. I think the challenge is sometimes maybe the input on the board will be on where are those gaps in the current executive structure. So that the next time round, I guess you're, you're not having to be drawn into it to certain extent. So, in a way, then, yeah, you'd find that more strategic input rather than having to get involved in this to get there. Any, any other questions? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure who mentioned this, but uh, you talked about the British bias on how governments work. So I just wondered whether you could say a little bit more about that in relation to the, to the guide for international NGOs. 
Yeah, the thought I can look at it in the back of my mind um, as well. We, we, we did some work for, for Start Network looking at the international um, organisations that wanted to join that. And when you sort of tie into an organisation in our country, say, and say, well, where should we stretch to? Where should we be committee? And they say, well, they're the king. So, yeah, <laughs> it, it seems to become a bit tricky. So, so I think having that sort of bias that there's a right way to do things, because that's how we did them here, was what I was thinking more. And, and some of that is, is shaped by the legal things. So, so that would create differences between Anglophone and Franklin countries, but also that there's much bigger cultural differences in just the way people interact with each other in hierarchies and all those things. Diversity not being legislated for in countries. So we, we, we tend to think that big regions be addressed and right and so sometimes the places we're working in their degree was what I had in mind. Yeah. Um, it's true that most of my NGOs are making big efforts to move decision making closer to where the work's being done. But at the same time there's a tension between that and the increasing tendency of donors, whether government or private, to be more and more controlling about how money is spent and where it's spent. Um, any ideas on how to educate donors so that they're Actually, a bit more trusting and uh, go along with the uh, with the power shifting tendency that everybody's trying to achieve. <clears throat> it's well, I think that's, that's a very interesting question. I think one of the uh, one of the benefits that could accrue to the international development sector of the UK is um, the loss of FCDO funding or the diminishing of FCDO funding, because actually, with FCDO funding comes a whole raft of um, issues around due diligence um, and you know in the guide we talk about partners and we talk about how donors can actually um, work to the detriment of the type of relationship you want with partners so I think actually losing some of the sort of strictures that um, FCDO places on on organizations could be to its advantage and I know there are a number of organizations within bond who said, actually, no thanks, we don't want to work with FCDO. They're not a good donor for the way we want to work. We want to work in this way, so we're going to see different, different kinds of funding. So I think it's, um, and I think there are limits to, there are limits to the, the amount. I kind of, for me, the expectation that FCDO is going to change to be suitable for um, a future um, uh, locally led partnership type of working, I, well, I suspect it may not it may never come to that and the, the, the need for government to sort of demonstrate how it's spending money will always sort of be um, too much for, for the, the type of way we want to to work. So I think, yeah, but, but, you know, I think the progressive um, the progressive organisations are saying FCDO, no thanks, we're going to see my, my funding from more liberal kind of um, regimes in, in terms of donors. People also and with government business models after the break, and, and, and what massively, and it's, it's probably another thing, but, 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 but those charities that fundraise and, and work off funds that they've got from individual donors and sort of small charitable funds and things like that have, have massively more scope to be flexible because they've got their CEO funding in the mix, it's, it's in the mix, and they've got their own money, but they can be much more, um, they can choose what to do with. So it's a big cultural difference between the heavily institutionally funded and the um, heavily privately funded charities in the sector as well. And, and making the money off the ones who've got the private donations at the moment, it might be capitalisation, but it might be the way to, to move. I think we will probably move to that more in the part two. But just one more question and then we'll... Um, yeah, just yeah. building on the whole discussion about trust, so as in the guide, principle absolutely right, transparency should be built in trust. My experience, not so much in the boards and on now, but in the past in the day jobs, being on occasion regulators and donors, particularly institutional kinds, see any transparency about things that have gone wrong as very negative and actually get punished. And that's caused a problem for the board in what I was saying, changing the culture. Because staff know the funding will get cut off or the project will get closed down if they are transparent about be it a fraud or a safeguarding case. I just wondered if you're seeing a change in that we want to be transparent, we do believe that that's the way to shift things and in a sense because we're doing it better there are more cases coming to light but then there's this 
there's a lack of motivation for yeah, staff, particularly to be because they know that there'll be a punishment of some sort. I think from an auditor's perspective, and the conversations we have, um, I, I would say most of the big donors, including the team, uh, from the EU, um, have been much more responsive to when people have admitted that there's been. So I've gone to them proactively um, when it gets kind of old. It's a, Sort of uh, not our bit, but uh, it's a bit of a different thing. But they, they seem to be quite open to if, if you come to them and say there have been problems and you've already got the plan but to uh, make things better, they seem to be more responsive. And certainly, call you sort of uh, serious incident reporting kind of regime has meant there's a lot more, but have to be, have to be open, doesn't it? I don't think you've had much experience with that. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, what I was going to add to that really is that. The, the, that also does raise the question um, around, so especially when you're um, with smaller, uh, you know, like the organisations as well. It's also about when funders, whether that's FCPO or whether that's you know, uh, a foundation, etc., when they go in, uh, often they're so focused on the project itself and if the organisations aren't able to actually reopen these and support the capacity, etc. You do also need to look at that in terms of where the capacity is. And if you can do that to actually support the systems, the structures, etc., and have that openness right from the start, then it's also easier to engage around these discussions of transparency, which is, you know, which is what we've done. Right. I feel like SGDO and John really pro accountability then, not to <laughs> yeah, the, the donors want to be told if something went wrong with your grant. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you need to say, hey, something went wrong with this grant. Mm -hmm. They don't want anything around your report. Mm -hmm. They don't want you to tell the truth today. So long as you, so long as you keep the eye closed doors, they're very. That's an interesting. Sorry, so I was thinking of the internal stuff, the, the between you and those stuff, mm -hmm. the worse the better. But yeah, yeah. So, uh, I've, I've not come across the. I was thinking, they get on the head. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Which makes it hard to then deal with staff yeah, because yeah. you have to learn and talk yeah. about these things and give them and change the culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you try to encourage that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> then. It's tricky. Mm -hmm. We have got one question. I have one more time. Yeah, so are there any mechanisms? Recruiting diversity that we can benefit from as an NGO. Mechanisms for increasing diversity. Maybe some practical tips with anything yeah. you guys have implemented, something yeah. like that, that you've been able to see through yourself. I'll give one example, perhaps, uh, from my um, organisation. So, this is about uh, diversity on the board and how do you bring that in, especially when you're, you know, the boards are much smaller now, etc. Mm -hmm. So, within the committees, uh, what we do is we don't only have board members on the committees, we bring in new people onto the committees. And then we have one board member who chairs, and then we've also got a staff from the executive who is part of it. So that's also a process to work with new people uh, to also then eventually be able to invite them onto the board as well. So that is one sort of practical way, if you like, of looking at that. Yeah. Just followed up with the consultation on capacity of funding program. Diversity and funding program. Don't diversify some income stream. Potentially. It's just a for more. Well, I don't talk to. Go and talk to those who fit with your world. To fit with the theme market. I think we talk about taking funding and those kinds of things. So on the original question that we thought we were asking, I, I, I know most of you already did this, but, but I think um, a, an open recruitment process for the trustees rather than the same gang going out and finding similar people is, is an obvious first step. Sorry, yes, because you just said invite them onto the board, mm. but actually if you have got your recruitment mm. process, it's really tricky to invite them. Mm. You invite them to, to apply, but yeah. Yeah, it doesn't always in my experience, it doesn't always follow through, mm -hmm. and that's where we really do play a role in making the boards as diverse and representative mm -hmm. as we would like them to, and, and no matter how much you 
network and advertising different um, forums, but mm. we, we still, we, I, my, my experience, I've still ended up with a, a, a highly skilled, but less representative, mm. which isn't ideal, and we're always open to it, but it's, it's really there's some entrenched sort of things I don't know what I mentioned earlier, but a, a, a lot of people are working. Yeah. They're going to find it hard to say, say you're not going to get a search on the I think we're a little bit past time, so we've probably sort of wrapped up and bring this session to a close. So thank you very much to the panel for the really good discussion, and thank you for your participation. Um, we're going to say goodbye to our online guests at this point. Uh, we're going to break up uh, a refreshment break and then we come back for part two. Thank you very much.